What I want to talk about is why regenerative agriculture. We've had quite a few speakers, particularly on Monday morning, but in terms of the, in terms of climate change and what we are facing and why we have to change agriculture if we are going to survive. A, a little bit about us, uh, we're Regeneration International, we're a relatively new organisation. Uh, Vandana Shiva, for instance, who wrote Saw Not All, she's one of our founding directors, Hans Heron, Ronnie Cummings from the Organic Consumers Association, and a few others. We are an organisation that works in food and farming systems, but more than that, as far as re regeneration is concerned, it's more than farming. It's also about people, peace, democracy. All of these go hand in hand. Farming is actually a social activity. The, why are we using the word regeneration? Because it is far more important than sustainable. What sustainable means is that we keep the current status quo and we don't run it down. We don't, we can't, you know, what I'm trying to say is we don't want to sustain what we've got. We've got to improve it. We've got to regenerate it. And that is why we're using this word regenerative. If we don't regenerate, we don't have a future. The, in terms of agriculture, we are using it as an umbrella term. We want to be inclusive, not exclusive. So we'll include agroecology, organic agriculture, permaculture, holistic grazing. There are numerous good forms of agriculture. One thing that's very important for us is that they all increase soil organic matter. And so I want to now just talk about why this is important. And we've had a lot of talk about climate change and going to renewables and cap and trade. I want to show what I regard as the most important figure of the lot, the only one that means anything. You can have all the figures about reductions of greenhouse gases and you know, adoption of renewables, but the reality is that it's all crap. The reality is that we are putting in more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than we ever have, despite Paris, despite all the talk. It was going up at two parts per million per year, and then in 2016 it went up to 3.3 parts per million. We reached 400, I don't know if I can use a laser, but we reached, that's, 400 parts per million in 2016. And that record there of ice cores is you know, the actual longest record we've got. As a species, we started about here. We're going into unknown territory. For the last 800,000 years, we've had a normal cycle of going up and down, and suddenly this is us. We've done this. We're going into, into essentially catastrophic climate change. And what I want to point out here, what is really important here is this. If, just say for some miracle, we went to renewables tomorrow and stopped putting out more carbon dioxide, at 400 parts per million, we go into catastrophic climate change. Renewables are non-negotiable. Getting rid of fossil fuels has to be non-negotiable, but we have to start getting it out of the atmosphere. If we don't, the world will, will be, you know, at the current rate, six to 10 degrees warmer, not one or two degrees that Paris has talked about. We've missed Paris, forget Paris. It's, you know, we missed Paris before we even signed Paris. The, um, I think what we need to get across here is that carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases, stay in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. There's a cumulative effect. What we put in now is going to keep on making us warmer and warmer unless we get it out. I think what I really want to get across here so people can understand, because some people go, oh, look, winters are going to be a bit milder. Maybe I have to turn the air conditioning up a bit more in summer. You know, what's a few degrees? To heat up our planet 
and we've, ha we've actually heated it up by about two degrees Fahrenheit. The amount of energy needed to heat up just the atmosphere, but also the oceans, that's why we've got these wonderful hurricanes about to hit the Carolinas, why Hawaii for the first time in history is getting two hurricanes ever in the same year, because the, the oceans are heated up. That is the energy of billions of atomic bombs. And I'm using this violent metaphor to get across what we are doing. We're putting all this energy into our climate systems and it is violently fueling it. So we're getting violent storms, hurricanes, floods, droughts, forest fires. And they're getting stronger and more frequent. And this summer is a wake-up call for the world. Scientists are shocked. But believe me, we haven't seen anything yet. This is a, like I said, it's a wake-up call. It's going to only get worse. So, you know, what we have to do is it's not about capping things. It's about reversing things and restoring us back. The, what we need to also get across, the last time we had 400 parts per million from the fossil records, sea levels were 60 to 100 feet higher. Think about what that means for the Bay Area. You know, nice little, little tropical islands here. But, you know, in terms of New York City and Miami and, and New Orleans, uh, cities like Bangkok, 30 million people, Manila, 30 million people, the country of Bangladesh, 150 million people, the Netherlands will disappear. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of people um, being refugees, along with all the food shortages and failures some of the predictions now, we're talking about one billion refugees by 2050. A bit over 30 years' time. How will we cope? We won't. There'll be wars. There'll be fights. There'll be disruption like we've never had. So, this is yesterday. The head of the United Nations. They're talking about the tipping point is in one year and three months. 2020. If we don't change things by then, we miss the boat. But I think what's really important is that we have to change the way we farm. And can we do it? And I want to show you, you know, there's some very good evidence here that soils are the biggest repository of carbon after the oceans. The oceans are the biggest ones. But like the atmosphere, we put too much carbon dioxide into the oceans, we're acidifying it. Where I live, we have the Great Barrier Reef, the world's biggest coral system, it's dying, in part because of acidification, in part because of the heat of climate change, and in part because of the chemicals of farming. Well, if we have a look here, can I just have a little bit more time, please? If we have a look here, we can actually see that um, the soil actually holds all, more than double, almost three times the amount of carbon as the atmosphere and forests together. This is where we need to put it. The good news is, is that we actually do have a process to start taking this out of the atmosphere and putting it in the soil. It's called the 4 for 1000. It was signed in Paris in 2015. I'm actually one of the physical signatures on this, one of the, the proudest moments of my life. And we now have over 32 countries. We have lots of regions. California's about to sign on. We have you know, major United Nations and other organisations behind this to change farming. And can we do it? I think this is the really critical thing here. You know, we've got a lot of people who are sceptical. Um, if people here on Monday saw Tim LaSalle, this is his work at Rodale, where by... Um, sorry... So just let me finish first. What we need to do start is to stabilise the question, stabilise the climate. The, at the can I just have a little bit more time, please? At the moment, we, we need to take out 16 gigs of carbon dioxide a year just to stabilise 16 gigatons. It's a billion, 16 billion tons. Let's have a look at some of the farming systems. Organic farming using compost. Rodale showed that they could actually take out 8.2 metric tons. Uh, that's 
that's a thousand, say, 8,000 pounds an acre of carbon dioxide. Sorry, 8,000 pounds and put it in, in an acre of soil. If we extrapolate that globally by farming systems, we could remove 40 gigatons. Simple system. This is what we're doing in Australia. It's called pasture cropping, where we are using highly biodiverse perennial pastures and grazing them down and sowing annuals into them, like oats, instead of getting rid of the pastures and ploughing them up. Um, in this case, our soils are very low in phosphorus, so a little bit of phosphorus, that's all that's gone in. No fertilisers, no pesticides, and the yields are just as high as chemical agriculture without ploughing. The, you know, look at the soil profile here. Um, if we sequestered, if we, if we adopted this one globally, we could do 80 gigatons. It's far more than our 16 gigatons. This is different versions of the same system where um, you can either um, mulch or, or graze down pastures and grow crops in it. In this case, it's a cover crop, a salad, highly biodiverse, but we can grow cash crops. And he, he's getting 11 metric tonnes. If you extrapolate that, that's 60 gigatons. David Johnson, New Mexico, using his um, very highly aerated compost, he's getting, um, what he's getting the equivalent of would be 184 gigatons a year. Now, what I really want to get across too is that all these systems are high yielding. This is the really good thing. We're not talking about losing yield. We're talking about increasing yield at the same time. And I want to finish on this. It's one of my favourites. Monday, Elizabeth Kaiser, just to the north of here, two acres, highly biodiverse CSA, um, agroecological system. And she gave some numbers. And so I did a little bit of maths and homework on it. To, um, I haven't got time to go through it, but what I'd like to show is this farm, the equivalent of this is 350 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's happening just a few miles north of here. These things are doable. They're shovel-ready. Okay. Grazing. You know, 68% of our agricultural lands are grazing. The same thing again with, with, with the right grazing practices. We could do 98 gigatons. Yeah, OK, just, I'm just about to finish. The, what I want to finish on here is this. Just... Transitioning 10% of our agricultural lands to good practice regenerative agriculture, just 10% could reverse climate change. And we could have negative emissions, bring the world back to the way it was in a few decades. That's all. Very achievable. Thank you. My name's Jessica Chartis. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis studying soils and biogeochemistry. Um, although uh, my path definitely did not start in academia, uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, is a little bit about my story of how I got to soils. Um, and then I'm going to share a little bit about my research and the work that I'm actually doing in the scientific community, and then kind of why I think uh, it, it needs to come full circle beyond just the scientific community, and we all need to kind of be engaging multiple stakeholders in this, in this work. Um, and so sorry, I don't know. I, we've advanced a little already. Is there a way to go back? That's a start for you? Oh, okay. We'll figure it out. Um, okay, so at any rate, as I mentioned, um, I, I did my undergraduate in business management. I was working in corporate sales for five years and ultimately ended up in pharmaceutical sales. And uh, this was back on the East Coast in the DC area, and I was uh, selling three basic products. One was, we'll just call it a lifestyle drug, and that one's not really of much consequence. Uh, and then the other two were cholesterol-lowering medicine and an antibiotic. And so as I was going to these doctor's offices and talking to people with far greater experience in the medical profession than I, um, I started to learn a lot about the products I was selling, which piqued my interest, and then I kind of went down the wormhole, uh, digging into the scientific literature to learn even more. Uh, and as I did, um, I, I guess I had two kind of separate experiences, one with the cholesterol-lowering medicine, 
where I had doctors that were countering me saying, why would I prescribe this statin that has such high risk of liver failure, which this was 10 years ago, and at this point, this drug has actually been removed from the market. Uh, but they were asking me, why would I prescribe something with such high risk if I'm getting better results switching my patients to whole grain cereal or having them add some flaxseed into their morning breakfast? And so that got me thinking about food as medicine uh, and, and kind of led me to really gain interest in nutrition and in the way that our agricultural systems inform our food systems and the way that our agricultural management informs the quality of the food that we're growing. Uh, separately with the antibiotic, uh, I had a coworker actually who had studied biochemistry in uh, undergraduate, and he was asking me about the antibacterial hand soap that we were giving out to doctors all the time that claims to kill 99% of germs. And this was, again, like I said, 10 years ago. So this was before Ed Young wrote uh, I Contain Multitudes and before Bill Gates came out and actually admitted that he was wrong about the hygiene hypothesis, which, for those who aren't familiar, is this concept that has evolved uh, in, in the Western world where we have to clean, every, you know, washing everything with soap and using antibacterial solutions. That is clean, right? That is what's healthy and clean. And then anything related to soil is dirty, right, and disease harboring. Um, and, and so it got me thinking about, one, the effect of these antibiotics on our own microbiome, both our skin and our guts, but also the fate and transport of these compounds in the environment, which ultimately means you know, where they end up in our soils and our water. Um, and so as, as I kind of um, started to question some of the things that I had been taught, I, I did the typical thing, and I quit my job, and I went overseas and traveled the world and ended up uh, on some organic farms, some really inspiring transformational farms, uh, and, and I saw what that did to the communities. Um, in places like Cambodia, where all I'd ever seen were infomercials of starving children, I saw prosperity and richness in community and culture and even, you know, and even wealth in terms of food and sustenance and all of these things. And so I started to realize that um, all these issues I was starting to care about, socioeconomic justice, the environment, human health and nutrition, they all were rooted in the soil, um, unintended. And so um, I came back home and I decided that the answer was science. You know, we just need more science to show people how important soil is and how it's connected to our health and our environmental health and our community and our economic health. Um, and so I called up UC Davis, the leading agricultural school in the world, and I said, I want to, I want to do a PhD. <laughs> and I basically got laughed at at first because I had no experience. Um, but I was persistent and I showed up and I was passionate. And ultimately, I got brought in uh, to work on a project um, related to carbon sequestration. And so here I am thinking, I'm going to come there and I'm going to do research that's going to show these connections that I'm so excited about. And I get there and, and I'm like, carbon sequestration, OK, you know, that's, that's the project you have for me. I'll do it. Um, and I'm going to skip back, like, okay, I'm going to skip back ahead to this slide that's out of place, because this was the mess of an experiment that I got thrown on, which is called the Century Experiment. It's a 100-year long-term experiment, which is really uh, to have a long-term scientific experiment is very rare. Uh, most grant cycles are two to three years. But carbon dynamics and soil processes operate on geologic time scales. So two to three years is a drop in the bucket. Um, so having long-term experiments like this is very rare. I didn't, and I didn't realize my good fortune initially, but um, essentially, What's going on here is that there's nine different management systems. So there's uh, corn tomato systems, and then there are wheat fallow systems. And the corn tomato, you have organic systems, which receive composted poultry manure and cover crop. You have uh, a mixed system, where you receive just cover crop and a mineral fertilizer. And you have a conventional system, where you have uh, just mineral fertilizer. And then in the wheat fallow systems, you also have a range of either irrigated or not irrigated, and fertilized or not fertilized, or having a cover crop. And so for the non-visual learners, uh, here it is in a list form. Um, and 
Basically, my job was to come in and compare in 1993 the samples they had taken to the samples they had taken in 2012. And, um, and so I was going to analyze these to look at the change in the quantity and the quality of carbon. And as I did, um, what we found, sorry. Uh, initially, just looking at the surface 30 centimeters, we found that, uh, the only s that both the organic, the mixed, and even the, the conventional system increased slightly in carbon. Um, the organic increasing the most, but notably the mixed system also increased significantly, right? Uh, so that's the mineral fertilizer and the cover crop. But then when we probe a bit deeper to 200 centimeters, uh, we actually found that the organic system was the only one to significantly sequester carbon all the way down to 200 centimeters, and the mixed system actually lost carbon. And so why I want to point this out is that this is the danger of a single story. It's the danger of looking at things narrowly uh, and a reductionist thinking, because traditionally, this is how soil carbon research happens. It looks just at the surface, 15 centimeters, maybe 30 if you're lucky, and it misses the rest of the story. And so uh, roots run deep. Uh, sorry that this resolution isn't so great. Roots run deep. And there are a host of mechanisms that can impact the movement of carbon to depth. Uh, so I started to get really interested in this because there's been all this hoopla and interest in carbon sequestration as a means of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, everyone thinks about how much we've lost from the combustion of fossil fuels, which is about 270 petrograms of carbon. But rarely do we think about the 140 petrograms that were lost when we converted forests and things like that to cropland, and then the additional 75 petrograms of carbon that have been lost through intensification of agriculture for a total of about 215 petrograms of carbon. Um, and as, as Andre mentioned, new predictions say we need to not just reduce emissions, but we need to actually sequester or remove 150 petrograms of carbon from the atmosphere. So I started thinking, well, especially in an environment like California where carbon burns off on the surface really fast, this depth portion is really important because there's a huge opportunity, all these different mechanisms for carbon to get down to depth. But again, it was reductionist thinking because carbon doesn't exist in the soil alone ever. It exists in the form of soil organic matter, which is about 50% carbon, and the rest of it is about, is, whether you want to call it the 14 or the 17 plant essential nutrients, all tied up in that matrix. And so you don't just sequester carbon, you sequester nutrients also. And we live in a world where nutrients are limited for agricultural systems. And so storing carbon at depth, actually where you have lower ratios of uh, lower amounts of carbon per unit, nitrogen for instance, wasn't actually the greatest solution. And furthermore, the fact that we're never looking at this depth means that practices that we think could be sequestering carbon on the surface might actually be leading to losses when you consider the whole profile as, as, our, as our research showed, right? Um, and so, essentially, uh, sorry, um, essentially, you know, I, I started realizing that there's a lot more to this story. Um, the, the four per million is a great initiative and it's, it, uh, it aims to sequester about 3.5 petrograms of carbon per year. The scientific literature suggests that you can reach about half of that, 1.85 petrograms of carbon per year, when you consider these nutrient limitations I mentioned. But something that's rarely ever talked about or even has been looked at is the microbial underpinnings of all this. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I'm going to run over a little bit too. Um, but the, this, we hear this story of carbon going into the soil through photosynthesis, right? And we've got these solar panels on the surface that take the CO2 and they put it into the plants and then they release compounds like sugars, amino acids, nucleic acids out their roots to feed the microbes in the soil, right? And then we think that's carbon sequestered. That's soil, carbon, soil organic matter now stabilized in the soil. And it's not that simple either because what's happening is that these microbes are eating these compounds and they're blowing off CO2 just like us. They metabolize, right? They break things down and then they build up new compounds to make their bodies. And so oftentimes when we do carbon research, we're looking just at the change in organic matter, just at the emissions. 
And we're not thinking about the whole equation. We're not thinking about efficiency. And so now research is starting to look at things differently. We're starting to say, OK, what is the carbon use efficiency of a given system? Because it's not just about pumping carbon into the system. Those microbes then need to break it down and make their bodies. And for that, they need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, they need sulfur, they need all these other nutrients. And so that's where limitations can actually lead to inefficiencies, because the microbes then have to go into the soil and look for those things that they need. If there's drought and they don't have enough water, they have to do work to survive. And as microbes' physiology is impacted by our management or by our climate, they're more or less efficient at storing carbon in their bodies. And the reason why it's important for microbes to be able to store carbon in their bodies is because organic matter is about 50 to 80 percent dead microbes. So in order to build organic matter, we need to build up our microbial population. And in order to build up microbes in an efficient way, we need them to be healthy. And in order for them to be healthy, they need to live in a good soil environment. And so that's where this does come full circle. I realize that we can do the science all day long, and, and we'll still debate every day how much the carbon sequestration potential is of a given practice whether or not you can scale some of the data that Andre shared with you across global landscapes. It's a challenge. But what we do know is that, thank you, is that when we sequester carbon in our soils, or when we do some of these management practices, we improve performance indicators. And that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at aggregate stability. We need to be looking at erosion. We need to be looking at how our practices are affecting water quality. Uh, and when we do this, we see time and again that the practices that Andre mentioned, they have a positive impact. The amount of carbon you can sequester globally through these management practices is constantly going to be debated by scientists. But what no one will ever argue is that if you increase your soil organic matter, you increase your soil health, and you improve all of these environmental outcomes and ecosystem services that we depend upon. And so that's where it comes full circle for me. That I'm working on my PhD, and I, but my goal is not to become a scientist. I'm working on an outreach project, actually, called Soil Life, to once again bring it back to the things that got me interested in soil, which are all the different aspects of our life that touches our food, our fiber, our clothing, our filtration of air and water, our foundations for architecture and engineering, pharmaceuticals, first antibiotic discovered in 30 years, found in the soil, the second in those 30 years, also in the soil, and countless of the previous ones that were discovered also were discovered in the soil. In fact, most antibiotics are discovered in the soil. Plants provide us medicine. They also provide a place for us to live, love, laugh, and play. And so I just want to bring it around to the fact that there's this danger of the single story of soils being the solution to climate change. Yes, they are a part of the solution. Yes, they be, if we make them healthier, we will be more resilient. But soils are important for far greater reasons. I'm starting off with this print by uh, Ricardo Levens Morales. He's a Puerto Rican artist uh, based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I love it because um, it's sort of reimagining the cafetales that exist in Puerto Rico um, and what it could look like if we sort of uh, continue to farm cafetales in this agroforestry system. Um, and especially what we heard earlier, especially with you know, climate change and increased uh, dramatic weather events, it's important to sort of imagine a different reality for agriculture. So, yeah, my name is Aida Guzman. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, and today I'll be talking about my own research um, looking at soil health in the San Joaquin Valley here in California. So, my research sort of takes this intersection, um, starting with the microbes that um, Jessica left off of. Um, I specifically look at our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and the way I look at this um, beneficial soil microbe is by looking at how farm management practices might affect uh, the below ground biodiversity. And a lot of this is motivated um, by working with rural communities, especially supporting farmers of color that are in the San Joaquin Valley. But the story, so the story actually starts a um, long time ago, actually. Um, and I grew up right in the middle of the Central Valley, um, in the middle of this uh, monoculture landscape surrounded by thousands of acres of almonds, thousands of acres of paste tomatoes, and sort of grew up with uh, knowing these sort of three things, um, that I was surrounded by degraded landscapes and contaminated soils, 
that there is this historical legacy of industrial agriculture. Um, you know, if people, if people came in in the past, you know, took over land from indigenous people, and then sort of created this industrialized uh, monoculture landscape that is the Central Valley. So if you ever drive down the I-5, you're pretty well aware of it. And then also um, poor public health outcomes for rural communities in the area. And, you know, I've had asthma since, um, since a kid, and it was just a common thing. It was sort of like coming of age, you get asthma. Um, so I like to think, as, as an ecologist, I like to think about how we can think about um, agricultural systems in this ecological manner. And so on the left, we have a natural system that provides all these different ecosystem services, including uh, water, f uh, water quality regulation, uh, uh, carbon sequestration that Jessica has touched on and Andreas has as well. And on the far right, we have intensive cropland, mostly focusing on only crop production and not the other services. And so what I try to focus on is how can cropland with restored um, ecosystem services provide all these other multifunctional benefits. And I specifically look at soil um, biodiversity. And in there we have you know, earthworms and different uh, mesofauna, macrofauna, these are um, burrowing at different sizes. And what I look at is AMF. So um, I'll be using the picture on the bottom, but basically AMF is this um, microbe that has, that wraps around the roots and helps the plants take up nitrogen and phosphorus and also helps with water regulation. And they're actually like 450 million years old. So they're super old and supposedly help plants get onto land. But with the focus on uh, soils being sort of sterile in the last hundred years, we sort of forgot that they exist and they're alive under the soil. And here, and in the picture in the far uh, corner is just them under a microscope stained from one of the samples I've taken. Um, so we can imagine diversification on farmland across different scales, from polycultures to hedgerows, crop rotations, riparian corridors, and these exist at different spatial and temporal aspects. So if we come back to the belly of the beast, where I grew up, um, we have you know, tons of monoculture landscape, but actually if you zoom in a lot closer into this landscape, we actually have um, small-scale farms that are um, highly diversified um, inside this landscape. So we're talking about uh, polycultures that are growing anywhere between like 50 to 100 different crops over space and time. And so with my research, um, so this is one of some of the farms. So we have some of the monoculture farms that I work on. This is just one crop. And then some uh, maps that I've made of the farms that I work on. This is um, just eight of the 30 uh, farms that I've been working with. And as you can see, every color represents a different crop. So they're highly diversified farms, and I think people don't necessarily imagine this in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley. And then with my research, um, I've, in, I've been seeing that as crop diversity increases, by no surprise, um, AMF increases. And as someone who's born and raised in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, I sort of see this as sort of glimmers of hope, but also thinking about how diversification uh, might actually improve the soil biodiversity, which is crucially important uh, to these other multifunctional benefits, including carbon. Um, and the crops, you've only seen colors. These are all the different food that's been provided, being provided by these farms. Uh, we see kohlrabi, chili peppers, uh, bitter melon, jujube, uh, tatsoi, um, lemongrass, etc. And so who are actually these farmers? So I'll end off with this uh, stories of the, some of the farmers that I'm working with. And so they're mostly managed by immigrant refugee farmers, mostly Southeast Asian and Mexican uh, backgrounds. And they've come in the last uh, 30 years. And so here's some of the farmers I'm working with. And I'm gonna tell you a story of, of some of them. So Isais on the far left, these are some of my favorite farmers. Like they say you're not supposed to have favorite students, you're also not supposed to have favorite farmers. I do have favorite farmers. Um, no shame. And then, so Isais on the far left, um, he, he farms a monoculture eggplant farm. Um, and he was able to buy his land uh, maybe five years ago. Um, but he's, when I came onto his farm, I, just, I found his uh, contact from uh, some people, and I came onto his farm. He had never worked with researchers. He had never heard of Extension. He had never heard of NRCS, RCD, et cetera. And so through this last year that I've been working, with last two years that I've been working with him, he's been sort of very curious of like, oh, you know, my, I've been farming eggplant for four years. It's not doing so well. And it's been all these different stories that, you know, we've been able to, talk to him, and I know he's really curious about how can he improve his land. And then Kay on the other side, she also owns her land, and she's growing, this is her farm on the, on the top, and she's really well connected with NRCS, and in the back she has an orchard of like four different fruit trees, 
and she has cover crops that she's been able to get um, uh, planted through a program in NRCS. And she's been able to she, uh, plant different crops through the years. And so these farmers by no means are typical, and one of those is because they own land. Um, but going back to the other farms, and I'm going to end here, is that a lot of these farms, these polyculture farms that are providing these tons of food are actually driving sometimes at 2 in the morning on a Friday and coming out to the Bay Area to your farmer's markets in the city, uh, to your farmer's market around the Bay Area. And they're actually selling their crops here because there's more access to different markets. And some of them, not farmers I've worked with, um, an extension agent uh, told me, have passed away because they have to wait uh, on the road and they've crashed because they have to come out so far. And so some of the things I think about in terms of you know, improving soil health in the San Joaquin Valley is much more than just ecological, but also it has to be policy driven and uh, socially driven. So some of the possible solutions that I um, like thinking about is one, as I mentioned, some of the barriers to be able to sort of take on these practices, one, that there's not actually equitable access to incentives. So there's a lot of, you hear about a lot of these like, you know, poster child stories of organic farms or, you know, like sinking frogs earlier. A lot of these farms are actually able to ha have a better access to these programs because they're well connected to different networks of researchers and uh, extension agents. Um, I also um, want to imagine these soil health training programs that actually um, address like the backgrounds of the farmers. And lastly, and then the other, the other last thing is that land access and land tenure is crucially important for small scale farmers, including the farmers I'm working with across California. There's so much corporate buyout of large expenses of land, and I think it's important if you want to move towards you know, diversifying farms and improving soil health that that's at the center. All right, thank you. My name is Jeff Borum. I am from the East Stanislaus Resource Conservation District. I will really quickly explain, if y'all don't know what a resource conservation district is, um, they are around California in each and every county. Um, we are this local entity that works with all the community, but often focus on agriculture with farmers and ranchers um, and looking to find solutions for folks within those communities. Uh, we are, we have a, different ones have different tax bases. We have a whopping $3,000 per year. That'll get you a whole lot of bubble gum, but not much else. Um, uh, and then from there, uh, everything else is grant. Uh, so everything I do is grant-based. I am housed out of Modesto, uh, as I believe Catherine said. Uh, however, all my grants take me statewide. And so I'm, I feel very lucky uh, to, be able to look at California from a, a fairly comprehensive uh, perspective, getting to travel all around of it, all around it. Um, this is just a pretty tree. All my pictures, they're just going to be pretty pictures. I don't have the research that they do. I don't do the research they do. I do work with researchers. I, I coordinate some compost field trials. Um, I coordinate some cover crop trials around the state. I do workshops around the state. I work on riparian restoration plans. I also uh, speak in front of the legislature and attempt to educate them. That is probably the least favorite part of my job. Um, go figure. But that's okay. I still think uh, it can be important. Um, working on the state, federal levels, international levels, very important. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is the local level and why I think it's important uh, and what my job and my work experiences um, have allowed me to observe and why I think uh, the local action is, is so important. Um, so this is just a workshop I was doing. This is, this is when I was skiing. I put this up here because skiing's kind of elitist, right? It's ski, like it's a privileged thing. And so that's just to let you know that I, I come at least partially from a place of privilege. Um, now if any of you live in houses or apartments or anything like that, uh, I don't, I live in a camper, and so, you know, sometimes there's balance between these things, and I want y'all to remember that, right? You, you know a little bit about me, but not too much. Maybe we need to ask some more questions, and we'll go from there. Um, so that was me talking about the compost field trials. That's me in a, a pit over there. I just wanted to show myself. Um, and this is me with some other folks working on these same compost field trials. Uh, look how everybody's smiling. They're having tons of fun. It's 105 degrees out, like 40 plus degrees centigrade. Um, we've been working all day, 
but we're all collaborating. Um, and this is one of the most important and I think brilliant parts of my job. Like on these compost field trials, I get to work with folks from UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara. They're brilliant microbiologists. They are brilliant biogeochemists. And the biogeochemists, Wendy Silver, Allegra Meyer, and Sintana Vergara all just came out with a paper. You're more than welcome to take a look at it. I can connect you with that. And it says wonderful things about what we can do about taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into our soil. And I think that's super important. But what I still feel is more important are these relationships. So Russell's got a cowboy hat. He's, a, he's one of the ranchers of this ranch. Uh, in the middle there in a plaid shirt, that's Giselle Heron. She is a nematologist from Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, we got people from UC Berkeley, we got people from UC Davis, we got ranch hands, we have Natural Resource Conservation Service, we have Josh Schimmel and Ken from UC Santa Barbara, and it's these collaborations that are so important. And the reason for that is that when I've gone out there and, and coordinated with these folks, you can see the rancher and the researchers start to connect. The ranchers often have this idea, in my experience, that these researchers are millionaires and billionaires, and they're gonna come out in their really fancy Teslas and not do any la manual labor. And what the ranchers have found is that they re these researchers come out and they grind on that soil auger all day, all day long, and they don't go to wash their hands to eat, they sit there and they pull their lunch out, just like the rancher would. And then you can see it in everybody's eyes. They're starting to connect. They're starting to feel. They're starting to realize that we're not all that different. Like, it's really basic stuff, right? But it's stuff that we need to remember, especially in these very divisive times, right? And so this is what I think is most uh, exciting, and that's, that's where I'm going to kind of go from there. Um, this is just an X-ray, I believe it's X-ray tomography, uh, four millimeter of pore space. And that is just to show you the networks that go on underground. So they're fairly complex, right? Um, but I think we could benefit from networks such as this within our community. A lot of things that community organizers already do, I'm just speaking specific to ag-related uh, items. So also what I found, I'm going to start talking. I'm just going to let you look at this pretty picture for a little bit. So what I've also found is that um, Really strong communities, really strong communities, I feel like, get the most done. Um, people that have a vested interest with each other, right? And that is something very difficult to find here, especially in the United States. And California alone is very heterogeneous, right? Um, but when you have these strong communities, often in rural areas, they tend to get a lot done. The different stakeholders, even though they have lots of differences, tend to find common ground much more than places with weaker communities or where the individual is propped up much more. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that's a very important part, the strong communities, right? However, those strong communities are often in rural areas and they have no voice or very little voice. Um, here in California, for instance, we have groundwater issues, right? There's water quality issues. Um, in a place I work far north in Smith River, they get about 120 inches, that's over 300 centimeters of rain. So their groundwater issues are a little different than the Central Valley, right? And so making blanket policies like that does not work. I love to tell the legislature that, I just doubt they're gonna listen anytime soon. Um, and that's part of the deal. You know, I don't think the legislature necessarily could listen soon. I think people should work on that, absolutely. I think people should go after that. Um, Y'all saw what Verizon did with the wildfires here in California and throttled things back, but I feel like Verizon could have done it. If AT&T was in that position, they would have done it. Any co company would do those things. That's how corporations run. And so we need to be wary of that but, and, and working folks work on those things, but simultaneously I think we need to be at that grassroots level uh, of pushing, pushing the local. Um, and so blanket policies and any policies that are gonna go, they take a long time anyways. As, as Jessica was noting, we need 25, 30, 100 years of data. Um, and so in order to do that, those little three-year blips are not going to work. So how do we do this? If you're in Iceland, you, you throw a revolution between like 2009 and 2011. How many people know about the Icelandic revolution? 
All right, just a few, right? So they don't talk about that, but they threw a bunch of their corrupt bankers and politicians in jail, and they kicked the rest of them out. So that's a possibility, right? <laughs> just knowing that, because people don't talk about that. So we need to talk about that. How do you go about talking about it? You need to meet folks. You need to converse. You need to connect. Um, because what that does is bring about empathy. And empathy brings about compassion. And I don't think that we can ask folks that are worried about getting shot by police or the fact that they can't feed their children, it's really hard to ask them to take care of the soil when they're worried about those other things. And so we need to take care of those things comprehensively uh, at the same time, right? And so what I'm asking for is just more pushes on local coordination uh, anywhere you're at and doing it with ag-related things because I believe as Miguel had put up, eating is a socio, like is a social, political, it's an economic movement um, and it's something that everyone can get along with, right? We all need food, fiber, all the things Jessica just mentioned. And so having more of this, creating more community cohesion uh, through ag-related events, stuff like gleaning and gardening and also mixing neighborhoods and everything, right? Like, here in California, I've been trying to promote like almost a foreign exchange student thing, but with adults in work or in agriculture so that people in the far no north understand what's going on in the Central Valley and maybe people that are making decisions in Sacramento can go other places and understand more things. Um, and so that's my, my biggest thing. Keep it local, keep pushing through these local ideas, and I think we need to remember that we all have emotions and that everyone else has emotions too, right? Uh, and these are divisive times, but we're all in this together. This is Team Earth. I've heard somebody say that before. And so if, if we go down with the ship, we all go down. But if we all work together, we can all ramp up, right? Uh, you know, I talked, the ancient Sonoran Desert people had, what, what did they build? 500 miles of irrigation, prehistoric engineering. And they did it with sticks. They did it with sticks and a bunch of them because they had a vested interest to feed each other. And that's what we have too. And so we need to connect on those things. And then I think doing that will help us to build a well-informed, mature, critical thinking citizenry. And that's what we need to move forward. Thank you.